the memory book a literary appreciation by philip kubetsky phd professor of english wake forest university thirty years ago as a reader of adidas sam rogers autobiography of a near listening I learned that this extraordinary spiritual master had was once taken a writing seminar at Stanford University as part of a master's program in English literature. In retrospect, this was rather like learning that a lion had consented to take instruction from goats. I also learned that in the field of literature he had made a particular study of the works of James Joyce, Marcel Proust and Gertrude Stein and other modernists and that his fiction was an experimental mode and that some years later he wrote but did not publish a prose narrative enticingly entitled The Memory Book for a young graduate student of literature, it was intriguing. Why had a spiritual adept, recognised by figures as eminent and demanding as Alan Watts and Swami Muktananda, pursue this particular literary path? I had been picking up and reading bits and pieces of Adidas' spiritual teachings for some time. What had always drawn me back to the books, I was no spiritual seeker, let it be said, were the striking titles, The Near of Listening, Scientific Proof of the Existence of God will soon be announced by the White House, Garbage and the Goddess, The Dreaded Gombu, or The Imaginary Disease that Religion Seeks to Cure, and Eating Gorilla Comes in Peace. When I finally began reading his books in earnest, I realised that Adida is a profound and original thinker, as he is an original and haunting stylist. Adida's thought was compelling to me for other reasons. His, expo his exposition and dismantling of the self and representation were in accord with the postmodern philosophers that I was studying at the time, like Roland Barthes, Jacques Derrida, Richard Rorty and Jacques Lacan, he had shown that the self was an effect of representation, and like them, he had come to this realisation, not through critical reflection, but through the discipline of meditation. In writing The Near of Listening, Adidas expressed this understanding through a treatment of the myth of Narcissus, the boy who becomes enraptured with his own image in a pond. Jacques Lacan, the famous Parisian psychoanalysis, had explored this same delusion in his essay, The Mirror Stage, a work that has had enormous influence in the academic world. To his credit, Lacan realised the limits of psychoanalysis and his own powers. He ends his famous essay with a striking passage that still mystifies many of his academic readers. Psychoanalysis may accompany the patient to the ecstatic limit of the Thou art that, in which is revealed to him the cipher of his mortal destiny. But it is not in our mere power of practitioners to bring him to that point where the real journey begins. Closer to home, the American philosopher Richard Rorty, in his book Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature, provided a contemporary, complementary analysis of Western philosophy, showing how it has been entranced by verbal representations of reality. Drawing from a phrase from Shakespeare's Measure for Measure, Rorty called this recurrent Western illusion of alienated identity our glassy essence. These prominent postmodernists 
have offered theories, but Adida has actually undertaken the journey of self-discovery. These devotees state that Adida was discovering precisely what it is to be an egoic human being and how it was possible to go beyond its frustrating confines. As he explains in the Near of Listening, Adida set forth as a young man on a path of intensive self-interrogation that occupied him throughout the 60s. A radical way of knowing and writing emerged from these experiments in consciousness. By 1979, by 1969, sorry, he had written the first version of the memory book, what I call a prose opera, or really a theatrical ritual or liturgical drama. By 1970, he had achieved the end of all seeking and begun his teaching and writing work as a realised adept. Dozens of books followed, including the remarkable Dawn Hall's Testament, first edition in 1985, expanded third edition 2004. During the 1990s, the memory book was adapted to the stage and performed as a gargantum, gargantuan drama lasting some eight hours, reminiscent of Peter Brook's staging of the Mahabharata. And now, after 25 years and further revision and amplification, Adidas Samraj has allowed his legendary book to be published. Given the immensity and thoroughness of Adidas Samraj's published writings, more than 60 volumes, one might wonder what role or function a prose opera or liturgical drama could play in his canon. One might also wonder what role a work of experimental modernist or postmodernist fiction could have in the exposition of Adidas Samraj's teachings? After all, modernist experimental literature is usually thought to be an aesthetic response to the death of God. The transcendental signifier and a cold eyed recognition of the strictly physical and psychological reality described by modern science. Joyce's, a portrait of the artist and Ulysses, for instance, tell of Stephen Dedalus's break with the Roman Catholic Church, D-E-D-A-L-U-S, Dedalus and his discovery of a new field of ultimate concern in the practice of art. The same could be said of the great other great modernists. They dramatised the modern movement from the absurdities of conventional religion to the spiritual potentials of art. And yet, in the end, none of them were able to make of art a satisfying substitute or a significant successor to the exhaustive power of spirit. By contrast, a memory book puts literary experimentation in the service of a realised representation of experience. Since the earliest times, the great teachers of mankind have leavened severe expressions of knowledge with story and parable. The Buddha teaches his followers the technical law of dependent origination. But he also tells the parable of the great rain cloud. Plato's dialogues are sometimes interrupted by the allegories of the cave, the myths of Atlantis and the narrative of air, er, fallen on the fields of Troy, and the hard paradoxes of Jesus, as dense as the gnomic utterances of Heraclitus are interleaved with domestic parables. This alternation between abstraction and narrative is not simply a way of keeping the slower students up with the rest of the class. Stories, myths and parables strike all of us at a profounder level of understanding than, arg than argument, however moving or eloquent it may be. The abstractions of philosophical discourse appeal to our conscious ability 
to retain and repeat. The sensual symbols and rhythms of poem and parable require that the whole of our being respond and complete the work of understanding. Plato's famous allegory of the cave tells of a prisoner who escapes from a shadowy den into the world of light. He realises that he and his fellows had mistaken a study of shadows for a knowledge of reality. While this allegory teaches us Plato's metaphysics, we are prisoners of dark matter but can have knowledge of the sunlit realm of the ideas. It also demonstrates how parables work. In providing the allegory, Plato's spokesman Socrates presumes that all of us will be able to see that it is more than a story. The story evokes knowledge not contained in words. A parable presumes that we know more than we think we do in presenting its memory of forms. A parable or myths brings us to the point of realising for ourselves its informing spirit. Adidas parable insists that the real world is in truth a memory. It's a word that some teachers will know will not know. Mommy, mummy, murmuring, memory. Is it describing the life giving, the tattered gorse of an embalmed corpse? Some murmured message, a memory mistaken for reality. A mummery is a masked performance by mummers, a traditional pantomime that goes back to the Middle Ages. One can still see troops of mummers in Irish country villages, dancing their Maurice dance and delighting everyone with their costumes, masks and tomfoolery. The point, of course, is for the rest of us to realise that we are all playing, that is why mummers are delightful. They free us for a moment from pretense. To see that social life, the real life, lived on this planet, is a mummery, is to see as Shakespeare does that all the world is a stage and we but players in it. Shakespeare, whose theatre was called the Globe, knew that the play is all too real for humankind. In order to dismantle this fiction, he played constantly with words, costumes and masks, perhaps thinking that to play with these elements of the memory could free us of his power. So too did his admirer, James Joyce. Early in Ulysses, Buck Mulligan rebukes Stephen Dedalus for refusing to pray at his dying mother's bedside murmuring to himself, a lovely mummer, the loveliest mummer of them all. Mulligan sees all of life as a memory, as a charade, so he can only believe that Stephen's sincere rejection of religion is an act, a performance meant to enlarge his reputation as a free thinker and bohemian. But Stephen sees deeper than his friend and betrayer, he sees the memory of words, of mathematics, of philosophy of religion. Later in the morning, while helping a student with his algebra, Stephen recalls Buck's mockery. Across the page, the symbols moved in grave Maurice, in the memory of their letters, wearing quaint caps of squares and cubes, give hands traverse, bow to partner, so, imps of fancy of the moors, gone too from the world. Averroes and Moses, Mabonites, dark men in main and movement, flashing in their mocking mirrors, the obscure soul of the world. So that's dark men in mind and movement. While Joyce, a master of language, realised that words can become our masters, 
his fictional double Stephen, a mystic without a practice, an artist without a craft, cannot live up to the great charge of recovering the obscure soul of the world. Stephen, like Joyce, frets with language without breaking free of its nets. In recasting his own life in the memory book, Adidas Samraj is in a very different position. He knows exactly what he wants to accomplish. This parable of the divine true love told by means of a self-illuminated illustration of the totality of mind deconstructs language in order to show us the possibility of complete surrender to and enlightenment by the divine person. Modernist and postmodernist writers pride themselves in having seen through and dismissed apocalyptic revelations and mystical enlightenment. Alidar Samraj, in direct contrast, has joined the modernist assault on the habits of ordinary language in his own visionary capacities. Opening this extraordinary text, the reader is drawn into a translucent, crystalline realm where the ordinary rules of reality are transformed by a new syntax, grammar and orthography. Herein lies the most striking form of achievement of the book, by undoing and unmasking the memory of words. Adidas makes words crackle and swoon, pound and console, with an endless suggestiveness guided by a desire to open up the reader's heart and imagination to the possibility of transformation. If the realist style of popular fiction reduces language to cliché, in order to present the reader with a readily consumable repetition of the memory of this world, the protean flux of Adidas' sacred parable returns us to the symbolism of the world's great mythologies. From the flat land of egoic realism, we are lifted into a polyphonic choral symbolism, operating on at least four levels, the literal, formal, mythological and Anagogic. The literal level is an apparently naive, guileless narrative of the wondrous child Raymond Darling, born into suburban America, living with an ecstatic awareness of the brightness of pure being. Raymond is nevertheless overshadowed by the lives and tales of his parents. In consequence of the crisis in a barber shop, a kind of initiation into the bogus status of mankind, Raymond is thrown from the bliss of selfless brightness into the mirror world of the ego, the world of mummers, who live out empty lives far from any knowledge of their true nature. Once in this world, Raymond encounters a series of characters, Meridian Smith, Mood Tom, a great fish, Pasco Moon, Blumar, Boomar, who aid in the recovery of his true identity. This great recognition is achieved through a rapturous encounter with Quandra My Bliss, his very and true heart. But no sooner is the idyllic love gnosis enjoyed than it is lost, as Quandra flees into the only forest of the world. Going in pursuit of her, Raymond wanders deep into the memory of this world, where he is captured and exploited by Evelyn Disk, a supposed acolyte, who wants to transform his knowledge and being into a brand name religion. The climax of the narrative deals with this conflict between the self-evident power of true spiritual knowledge represented by Raymond and the memory of institutional religion represented by Disc. At the level of form and style, the memory book is reminiscent of Lewis Carroll, Gertrude Stein, E. E. Cummings and Joyce. These writers were interested foremost in the sensual and substantial body of words 
Although critics disagree what purposes their polysemic discourses serve. Alida's words are elements of a sacred play, a liturgy in which rhythm, repetition and dreamlike imagery release us from the familiar memory of realistic discourse and evoke the world of myth. Ritual liturgical language is meant not to convey information, but to transform our minds, to turn us away from ordinary consciousness to the perennial and timeless realm of the sacred. Alida's formal, ritualized yet simultaneously whimsical and devastating liturgy, liturgy transforms our attention, evokes long forgotten sensations, desires, fears and hopes and makes us ready to encounter the archetypal myth of the spiritual hero. The myth of Raymond Darlin, his name suggests, the beloved light of the world, is a contemporary enactment of the timeless pattern of the hero. At the primordial ground, myth is, as Joseph Campbell puts it, a cosmogonic cycle. It dramatises under various guises the splitting of the primordial one into duality and the ultimate recover of unity through the coincidence of opposites, male and female, subject and object, time and eternity, light and, dark, light and darkness. At the human level, this cosmic drama concerns a hero's experience of originary wholeness, a fall into time and duality, and a redemptive transformation of consciousness represented by an heroic journey, confrontation with a principle of egotism and a recovery of wholeness represented by a lost treasure, a maiden, a goddess, a grail, according to the mythic round, only unique human beings heroes and demigods, can undertake this symbolic journey for others and so become the founders and sustainers of societies. Raymond's mythic journey, from the brightness of whole mind to the memory of this world, from the memory of this world to the unity with the goddess Quandra, follows the pattern of the great spiritual heroes, but with a difference. Raymond Dolan does not achieve a redemption of mankind, such as, for instance, Jesus is said to have accomplished through his death. He loses Quandra and is destroyed by evil in disc, a figure of the obstructor or diabolus, diabolus, who represents the aspects of consciousness that clings to words, signs and symbols. Raymond's originary light and brightness, the essence of his realisation and teachings, is eclipsed by Evelyn's disc. Yet this metaphorical eclipse, like solar and lunar eclipses, is passing. In the end, Raymond realises that the bright is never lost. He saw the midnight sun, the uncentric sphere of boundless bright. He saw the room is consciousness the one in bright itself. Raymond thus discovers in his inherent unity with Quandra, the inherent unity of consciousness and energy, and the folly of all seeking, questing, and journeying toward what is always and inevitably present. It is the function of the fourth and last level of the spiritual text, the anagogic, to lead the reader onward, Anna plus Goggy. From the levels of plot, form and myth to transcendent knowledge. The prologue to the memory book prepares us for this anagogy. Or anagogy. In a sustained lyrical address written like this.
This awful parable of mine is a purifying fire of all illuminating brightness that will forever burn a living light within the natural fireplace of your incendiary heart of eagle's eye. And the epilogue concludes the parable by warning that true seeing, hearing and knowing can occur only through radical perception, not through disembodied thought. This hard parable of me cannot, by thought and self, be truly understood as perfect, true and truth. To understand me, you must hear and see me, with your always listening to me, feeling art. The anagogic, then, should not be confused with some immaterial, spiritual or remote level of reality, far from the sensory world. The four levels of interpretation fashioned by medieval scholars are nothing more than models for deepening our understanding of complex texts. They fall away in the moment of insight, when selfless observation undertakes the habits of egocentric perception. Alidar's work, so similar in form and style to the most radical kinds of postmodern writing, is of course, not confined to the postmodern moment. Shining through this radical, disruptive and multi-leveled narrative is the tradition of wisdom to be found in the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, the Heart and Diamond Sutras, Dojan's Shobhagenzo, and other works that retain after many centuries a disconcerting con contemporaneity and timelessness. As playful as it is profound, as heartbreaking as it is consoling, the memory book is an absolutely unique literary occasion. Contemporaneity.